In this week's podcast, we speak to veteran sports reporter and former New York football manager, Frank Brady, who gives us a preview on the 2020 New York championship scene. Frank has been attending games at Gaelic Park since the 1970s and writes match reports for the Irish Voice, Irish Echo and IrishCentral.com. Frank gives us a rundown on all the adult men's grades in both hurling and football for this year, as well as the ladies' football division. We also touch on how COVID-19 has affected this year's championships in terms of turnout and standard, now that the J1 summer sanctions have not been able to travel. And it's just me for this one. Johnny is off getting the colour done in his hair. I kicked off the podcast by asking Frank to give us a quick rundown on his background and how he's been involved in GA here in New York over the past couple of decades. Uh, I, I came to New York 50 years ago, one of the first students on a student exchange program uh, in 1970. And I was absolutely amazed uh, with the Gaelic Park. First of all, I thought it was a much larger structure at the time because we had been listening to commentaries from the Hollow here, especially the great battles uh, that Galway and New York had in the mid-60s. But uh, then I, I came to New York quite frequently after I started teaching in Ireland and I, I moved there permanently in 78 and uh, played football uh, for many years. And uh, that when you can't play any longer, you usually end up in some other capacity. So I was managing a, a number of different teams, including Leitrim, for a number of years in the 90s. We managed to win five championships. Then I had the honor of uh, managing New York, uh, the first uh, New York team that played in Ireland in 1999 we played Mayo in Castle Bar and it's the 24th anniversary of that so I think we're going to have a reunion perhaps later on in the year and uh, then when I got out of management I got got into a bit of journalism uh, writing for the Irish Echo and I'm currently writing for two papers the Irish Echo and the Irish Voice at Gaelic Park so I have uh, uh, quite a bit of experience of hanging around Gaelic Park it's like an addiction in, in some way I'm nearly always there you know so yeah, you're, you're, you're up there most nights now in the last couple of week, weeks, Frank. So uh, how's it been going? It's been going very, very well. Uh, we just kicked off three weeks ago and uh, there are practically games every evening, two games every evening, three games on a, on a Sunday and it's running very, very well. Most games are very competitive. Uh, there's a couple of kind of interesting sidelights to it. Uh, there were concerns initially uh, most teams would struggle. A few teams did struggle, but many teams are doing quite well. They have plenty of substitutes. And a kind of an unintended consequence of this, I would say, was over the years, we would have had a lot of summer players coming out, students and sanctioned players. Well, they are not here with the result that many of the local base players, particularly those who have come through the minor board, are getting an opportunity to play. And may I add, playing very well for the most part. Uh, there the were a, a couple of... Uh, defection, shall we say, at the senior football level. Uh, Two teams uh, failed to feel. That was Donegal, which were in the final last year and which would have won a final a couple of years ago. And Longford, which also uh, won uh, a New York final two or three years ago, which leaves the the flagship division with only three senior football teams in it. Uh, That being Sligo, last year's uh, champions, and St. Barnabas and Rangers. Uh, Two clubs that are feeling three teams with nearly all American-born players, which is absolutely wonderful uh, to, and a testament to the work that's been done at the minor board in New York here. So how is that going to play out for the, the senior championship with only three teams, Frank? Well, they're going, they're, going, they're going to play a double round. Uh, each team will play. Uh, so it, it'll be a fairly short competition, but that's the reality. Okay, so just, just getting back, Frank, so obviously the whole... The whole world, the whole the whole GA scene here has been affected by by COVID nineteen. The intercounty game back in May when that was uh, New York was supposed to play Galway that that was lost early on. Um, a big loss, of course, for everyone here involved in GA to to lose that game, such a big game and such a big um, highlight of the year. Yeah, you're 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 absolutely correct, Michael. That is the highlight of the year on the New York GA calendar. And e- even though New York have never won, they have come close a couple of times. And some of the critics said that the game uh, should be abandoned altogether. However, that's a very narrow-minded view. It's a massive weekend in New York. The diaspora come from not just all over New York, but from Canada and all over the U.S. And it's like a great gathering or a great reunion. It's one of the liveliest and best weekends in New York from an Irish perspective. So long may it continue. 
Yeah, and I was really looking forward to it this year, Frank. There was a, a new management set up and there was a big push to bring those uh, homegrown players through this year. I think there was, we had Johnny Glynn on a couple of months ago on the podcast and he said that uh, Jerry Fox, who's the manager this year, was trying to breathe a lot of the, the younger generation through. So it would have been, uh, it would have been nice to see uh, the fruits of his labour over the winter months. So disappointing to go, but uh, you know, it's for the year that's in it, uh, we can... We can look forward to next year. Well, well that's that's the plan because there, there there are development squads, and the good thing about it is that they had been training uh, with the New York team and getting very very valuable experience. There are some very skillful American-born players here in New York, and a number of them have played for New York over the years, including uh, the Hogan brothers and Mike Cregan. And uh, going back when I was the manager, we certainly had three, two or three New York-born players. Kevin Lilly who at, I don't know what, he's 40-something, is still playing junior football in New York here. So, Wow, jeez. So how, like, how has it progressed since you, since you managed back in uh, 1999? Um, <laughs> Frank, has, the, has much changed and has it been changed for the good or the better? But as, as you said earlier, we're, we're getting closer to that win. Uh, yes, we, we, have, we have gone to... Uh, uh, extra time uh, on I think two occasions and I think those are both against uh, against Leitrim and uh, I was a um, trainer and selector with New York on one of those instances and uh, basically got myself excommunicated from the Leitrim community for being associated uh, with the enemy <laughs> but as, as as one very prominent New Yorker said it's only a game it's not a war <laughs> no, you, you, I, I, I think we do. I think I do. I don't know. Did you mention that at the start? But you're you're a Leitrim man, just so people. Uh... That's correct. That's correct. Lovely Leitrim, I add. <laughs> <laughs> and at, normally at this time of the year, that's where I am for five or six weeks. But we postponed the holiday for this year due to the uh, restrictions and possibly reintroducing some of the restrictions in Ireland. So I'm spending it in the Big Apple this summer. Yeah. So. Up in Gaelic Park. So tell me. What well, yes. Yes. What, so what's the situation now in terms of um, spectators being allowed to go into Gaelic Park, Frank? What are the... The, 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 the crowd is... Well, there's no, there's no problem with the social distancing in, in, in Gaelic Park because the stand is, is quite expansive and the crowd has been gradually growing. Every, every evening there are a few more and because the word has got out that the, most of the games are highly, highly competitive and very good fare, and people are enjoying it. And there's not much else to do in the evening anyway, except uh, go to Gaelic Park. Yeah, and so there's, so in terms of, I know there, there's been big developments at home, Frank, in terms of spectators. Spectators are all but banned now from GA games. So spectators are, is there a cap on the, the number of people who can? No, no, so far, so, so far we haven't have to introduce a cap because as I said, the stand is expansive enough that the spectators can sit well apart from each other. And there were also some provisions made for the teams. Only the two teams are allowed on the sideline at any given time. There's a 15 minute uh, mandate water break uh, where a bit of sanitization takes place and it stops this procedure of fellas running onto the fields with bottles and uh, no team is allowed onto the field until the two teams that have just competed have left. So there's minim minimal interaction amongst the players. Okay. And uh, so we just, we, were, we just touched on the senior championship there, uh, Frank. So there's only three teams there at, at the moment. Uh, have there, has there been a round of games? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Sligo uh, played Donegal so far, and then uh, Donegal opted out after that. So the... the uh, Senior Championship uh, starts up again this weekend. And as I said, it's a double round uh, with Sligo. Uh, they won the championship last year. Uh, they have a, been building a very strong squad over the last few years. They won the intermediate a few years back. And they have a very strong local-based team here. And they got a major uh, boost this year uh, with two former inter-county players, uh, Neil Murphy from Sligo, the full forward, and Peter Cook from Galway are on a year's leave of absence out here and Sligo managed to get them on their roster. So they're a formidable opponent at the moment, but they already played St. Barnabas and St. Barnabas had all American born team except one player and Sligo beat them by two points. And I think if uh, young Mikey Brosnan had a bit of luck, he had one shot that came back off the crossbar, but had it going on there, uh, St. Barnabas would have beaten Sligo. But uh, anyway, they're, they're, uh, they're in with a very good chance and uh, a, lot of, a lot of neutrals would love to see an American-born team 
win the New York Senior Championship. Uh, has it ever been done before, Frank? Are no, you- it, has never, it has never been done before. And uh, as I said, it kind of a, an unintended consequence. Uh, over the years, New York might have often been blamed as being overly dependent on Irish players and especially summer players. And uh, the downfall or the downside of that is that the people who come through the minor board are sometimes do not get a fair shake. But this year, they certainly are. Yeah, this is, uh, just for people who, who, who might know me here, that I, I was playing with Kerry last year and we actually, the club opted to drop down to, from senior to junior before COVID. So, uh, By the way, I have good news for you. You're, I, I just came from Gaelic Park. Your former team, Kerry, uh, they pulled the win out of the bag very late in the game against a Monaghan team who was also senior a number of years ago, yeah. but dropped down two grades as well. And... Uh, Kerry did very well to get a victory this evening. Brilliant, uh, yeah. He introduced uh, a former Kerry player. He had a brief career with Kerry in Ireland, Gary O'Driscoll. And Gary came on and scored a couple of very valuable points. And they have a very good centre-half forward or full forward, Niall Medin. I think he's a former down player. And they yeah, have a good, yeah. uh, a pretty good Ooh, squad. Yeah. And of course, it's great for Joan Henchy. Joan is the first woman uh, to be chairperson of New York GAA and of course Kerry is our club and it's managed by her husband Brendan so Brendan, uh, she yeah. was very happy this evening yeah <laughs> yeah she she lives and breathes it and uh, we asked her oh, yes, yes yes we asked her she's a life she said she's too busy <laughs> she's too busy with COVID so well, 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 COVID, well and, but there's extra there's extra work on her on her shoulders yeah. this year of course with the well and in, fair, in fairness to her she's there every evening uh, to ensure that everything runs smoothly and it is running very, very smoothly. I have to grant her that. You know, she's definitely putting the time in and, uh, you know, uh, endeavouring to get everybody else to do as much. Yeah. And so, um, so going down then, there's a, how many, there's a, for intermediate football then? Frank, intermediate, six, there are six, six teams. Six teams. You have Cavan, Leitrim, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Mayo, West Mead. And the, the two more, most powerful teams at the moment would be Brooklyn, and Brooklyn had a very good win over Mayo this evening and Westmead, which is also a team that has dropped down over the years. And uh, the games have been quite competitive, even though Brooklyn had a rather easy enough victory over Mayo. But then again, having said that, Mayo are missing uh, two very, very good players. One, uh, an Irish-American uh, born player, uh, Shane Slattery, who I'd say was on target to be top scorer in the intermediate division this year. And he got injured and he was a huge uh, loss to them. So... That's the intermediate. The I junior forgot, I forgot A. To say, I forgot to say there with the senior, uh, Frank, with the Rangers team, they're, they're, they're heavily um, they, um, American-born as well, aren't they? On the, in the they're nearly all American-born. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Yeah, so, and you say, so who, who's your pick for the senior championship this year? Well, <laughs> We're I have put to put you say, on the spot now for all these yes, championships. Yes, put me on the spot. I, one of the clubs that I was with over the years was, was St. Barnabas. And I said, they're a very talented, very skillful bunch of players. And I, I know they lost their first game to Sligo, but Sligo cannot get any more players. They have what they have, but I think uh, Barnabas will learn from the experience. So I'm picking St. Barnabas, and that's somewhat biased because I train St. Barnabas a number of years back. So, but I'm sticking with St. Barnabas. Okay, brilliant. So, Greg, getting on to the intermediate there again, Frank, and you, you were just saying that... Um, Course, the seniors have taken a hit this year, but the, you were telling me that the, the other grades, that there's been a huge turnout and that the, and, and there's been a big commitment by people living here to, to get out and play with their clubs this year because you don't have that thing where sanctions are coming in and that might take someone's place or whatever, you know, from previous years. That, that's so, true. That, 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 that definitely has, has uh, propelled a, a greater level of commitment from the players that they're here because now they know that if they make the effort, if they train consistently, that they're not going to get bumped off when somebody that comes from Ireland that's maybe perceived as a better player. And sometimes they are not. But the fact that they are brought over, managers feel that they're kind of obligated to play them and that the the native-born player uh, you know, suffers as a result. But that's not the case this year. There is certainly great commitment uh, from most of the other teams and the players that are involved with them. Okay. 
And so we so we've got a round of matches in nearly all divisions. So, so yes, the, yes, the kicked uh, off, intermediate kicked off, and the juniors. And the junior, same junior, way. junior A, which uh, has is the biggest division. There are eight teams in it. Uh, there, there are St Barnabas, uh, there are Cork, Monaghan, Kerry, St Raymond's, Rangers, Rockland, O'Donovan, Rossa, and uh, right now uh, the uh, uh, St Barnabas look very strong, as do. Uh, Kerry, Kerry, I said, had, had a very good win this evening. And also Rangers. Those will be, I'd say, the teams uh, vying for top yeah. honours. Monaghan were going well until this evening, until they bumped into Kerry. And they led by a couple of goals early on. But as I said, a great finish by Kerry uh, derailed them. You know, so. And then in the, uh, there's also Junior B. And there are seven teams in Junior B. And these Junior B teams are basically all American-born players. One very relatively new club that started about uh, five or six years ago, Shannon, Shannon Gales out in Queens. Uh, they are uh, top of the table at the moment, but there are five brothers uh, playing on the team, which I, th I think is a record in New York, the five Matters brothers, and they, they play a very, very attractive brand of football. Uh, you can see that the coaching has improved substantially uh, in recent years in New York, gone is, uh, are, long gone are the days was a catch and kick. Now it's, you know, a possession game, moving the ball with plenty of support play. And uh, the coaches, as I said, across all the clubs in the minor board are doing an excellent job at that. And it's great to see Shannon Gales, a uh, very fluid, fast moving game that they play with all of the player running off the shoulder up in support. You know, so and so that's, that's, that's they'd be a that's, young team as well, Frank, wouldn't they? A very, very young, yes. Under yes. twenty one team would yes, uh, yes. through the development ranks. And a lot of them would would have uh, represented Fela over the years and also would play it on the university's teams as well, which gives them a great outlet and uh, you know something else to play for besides the local competition. Yeah. And Frank the the, the junior like there's always been a, a, a lot of teams involved in the junior A and B championships in New York. You know, there's always a lot of teams. It's can be very, I know from refereeing there last year, there can be some games that are maybe one way, one way traffic only, but then there are a lot, plenty of competitive games. And I heard there's been a few good, I heard there was a good Cork and Kerry clash there last week up in Gaelic Park in the junior A division. You're, a feisty. you're absolutely right. I, I, I was there. I was there watching it, and as I wrote, Cork looked that they were going to run away with the game. I think they led by one seven to a point or two at one stage. But two things happened in the game. Cork lost a very tenacious defender for some indiscipline, and as I said, Kerry introduced a proven score getter and a fall. A good forward, a former good forward. This man played with Kerry a number of years ago. He also played with a couple of clubs in New York. Gary O'Driscoll. And Gary came in, made a huge impact. And the fact that Cork lost a defender, uh, made them, the game ended up all square. And neither, neither uh, bench was happy. So <laughs> <laughs> The only person I was happy that day was the referee, I'd say, Frank. <laughs> when it was tight like that and, and you call it a draw, every... <laughs> <laughs> the referee is happy. There's, there's... Well, well, you know, if the sideline, if both squads on the sideline are not happy, the referee can be assured he did a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a former referee, so I. I... You were say, yeah, you were saying that, right? So you've done everything in Gaelic Park. You've you've played, you've managed, you've trained, you've refereed. Yes, and you write, and you also co-commentate and commentate up there with uh, Seamus Smith some days. Seamus Smith, yes, yes. Shemi is the voice of Gaelic Park. I'm only a poor substitute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've uh, I, I've spoken to Seamus a few times, and I've heard him up there. He's a great color commentator. Yeah, yeah, and and you know what? He's 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 great. He's, he's, he's great for the older generation because a lot of them don't know the players and, and with a commentary provided by Seamus, it adds considerably to the game and their understanding of the game. So it's great that he, that he does it. You know? Yeah, I did. Just, I, I did an interview with Seamus last year when I was doing, it was on the Irish Examiner podcast. Uh, we yeah. did a little 10-minute segment with, uh, with Seamus and he gave a great rundown on the history of Gaelic Park. And, but he knows his GA knowledge is just unbelievable. I, I, he asked me what year I was born, 1984, and he rattled off the All-Ireland winners of every year since 1984. But, well, uh, if you don't have access to Google or an encyclopedia about GA matters, <laughs> he, he's the next best thing, if not better. <laughs> Big shame me, yes. Brilliant. And his party piece at some functions is reciting all the All-Ireland winners from day one <laughs> and the captains. <laughs> 
But as you say, it's it, it, it's a great feature of Gaelic Park up there to have that. Uh, it's so in case people are listening from in Ireland and have been to Gaelic Park, it's open air commentary, so you hear the commentary as the game is going on, and it is great for people because there's so many people coming in that you wouldn't know. And Seamus would have a knockdown where the persons after coming from who they played with, you know, who their father was, who their father's father was. Correct. So. <laughs> well, once, once in a while, we, we have had a lot of commentators over the years, uh, but once in a while, some of them would step out of the, beyond their, shall we say, accepted boundaries a little bit. For instance, if there was a, a kind of a heavy or a dangerous foul and the, the commentator might be associated with the team, <laughs> you might recall it or regard it as a harmless one or not a, one that should be counted. <laughs> that has happened a few times. <laughs> Brilliant. So, who are you calling for the junior A and B divisions? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm calling for the for the junior junior A. I'm calling Saint Barnabas, and for the junior B, I'm calling Shannon Gales. Okay. So we, please we, <laughs> don't come back to haunt me with this if I get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> just I just going getting out to Paddy Power there. Yeah. So, so Barnabas could do the double junior, junior A, and uh, yes, very, senior. yeah. They're they're one of the few clubs uh, that field three teams along along with uh, uh, um, three teams, and I've also been reminded uh, that Westmead field three teams as well uh, between hurling and football. You know, but uh, uh, Barnabas and Rangers are all football. So. Okay. Brilliant. So we'll um, we'll switch over to the the hurling side of things. The men's hurling, uh, uh, Frank. I suppose Hoboken are always the are the, the team that have been up there. Yes, the Hoboken. The, uh, the interesting thing: there are six teams in hurling. Hurling has struggled uh, for a number of years in New York. Here now they have six teams competing this year at senior level, and Hoboken definitely uh, would be the favourites, but. Ulster are no pushover either, and neither will Tipperary. And uh, then you then you you have Waterford, Westmeath, and Limerick. And the interesting thing about Limerick, uh, Limerick are nearly all Irish American born hurlers, which is absolutely great. There are a couple of underage hurling clubs in New York, uh, in Rockland and Lakela in the Bronx, and uh, as well as Shannon Gales. And uh, the fruits of their efforts are beginning to show, which is great. Okay. And they they're also competing. New York has also been uh, competing in the hurling and the failure competition with a hurling team over the last over the last two years. Okay. So every aspect of the GA has been developed here in some capacity or other. You know, so. And and so if if there are homegrown players there with uh, with Limerick, who they have played with uh, coming up, Rockland, you said was uh, Rockland, Rockland and Lakela is uh, a team that kind of covers the Bronx. And uh, Mike Kennedy, a uh, t- former Tipperary man, you know, would be one of the main driving forces behind it. You know, okay. So. And so, like, Rockland have that big complex um, up in Rockland County, uh, obviously. Um, so, would they would they be looking to kind of progress on to build a senior team in years to come, Frank? Or? Well, you know, they, they've had a senior team over the years. And, uh, you know, when we have the, the, the relegation and promotion, they have dropped down. And they certainly should be on target to eventually get back to the senior ranks uh, because they have some wonderful, skillful underage footballers. And I don't know if you know or not, but Rockland GA Club suffered a tough loss last week. Uh, one of their great players and a great coach, Noel O'Connell, uh, passed away. Noel had a neurological disease for the last two years and uh, he would have coached and managed uh, failure teams, New York minor teams over the years and he was in his mid-60s, and he passed away during the week. And the interesting thing, uh, from a coaching point of view, many of the young players that I spoke to would regard him as their most favourite coach over the years because he was ultra-positive, no negativity, no condescending, caustic remarks or anything like that. He did the best that he could to get the best out of them, and they appreciate it. But unfortunately, he passed away during the week. And his daughter plays... plays uh, uh, for, for with the with the Rockland ladies, so. and it's um, a huge loss, Frank. And I saw the the New York GA put it up, and I think it was on Irish Central as well. There was a, a, f- a few articles about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, is it hard for is hurling hard to maintain? Well, football is obviously more popular with the having a in senior intercounty team. But hurling is that bit harder to maintain in terms of the homegrown players, Frank? Is it? 
Yeah, yes, well, over the years, they, years ago, they used to say that the Irish mothers or the Irish American mothers didn't want their, their sons playing hurling because it was a dangerous game. But I think that mindset has been changed. And the, the fact that there are, you know, several hundred kids playing hurling these days and there are no major injuries, I, I think they've, they've got over that fear. Uh, but it, it has always been uh, a lot more footballers in New York than hurlers. But as I said, with six teams at the moment, there's nothing certainly wrong with that, you know, playing senior hurling in New York, which is, which is very good, I think. And have they, have they kicked off, Frank, in the... They, oh, yes, yes the, hur- the hurling has kicked off, and, and uh, the two top teams at the moment would be Hoboken and Ulster, followed by, by, by Tipperary. They, they would be the three top teams okay. at the moment. So who's your call for that championship? I'm going to get, in, get you into fierce trouble here when people are listening to this. Yes, uh, <laughs> I may have to go into hiding later on in the year. Or so I say, what do you know about hurling being from Leitrim? <laughs> well, I said Leitrim hurlers were in Croke Park last year. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would pick uh, Hoboken and, and Old Star. They would be my two favourites. Okay. Too. And what's the, is there, is there still a junior hurling championship, Frank? Uh, no, I, I think what's going to happen as, as the, uh, the current system plays out that the, uh, they, they may take the top four teams and play those four off in a senior championship and maybe play the lower two teams off in an intermediate, in, in a junior final. I think that might be the plan. So. Okay. So that's so the six teams in the six teams. Yes, playing six teams all together. Okay. Uh, and it, you know, needless to say, you know, that, the two teams at the bottom, you know, or would wouldn't have that much to contend with. Yeah. But if there's a, a chance of winning a junior championship, great. Yeah. And as the what's the standard of hurling been like this year, Frank? Oh, the standard hurling is very good. Oh, it's very very good. Some some very good hurlers in 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 New York. You know, it it uh, it certainly hasn't uh, the standard of hurling hasn't gone down uh, by any means in 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 recent years. So. Okay. And so, Frank, we'll go on to the, I know the, the ladies' football is quite competitive and you are you know quite a lot about the ladies' football as well. You still referee ladies' football? Yes, right? yes, I still, I, I still referee ladies' football. The ladies uh, are training at the moment, but they haven't started uh, any competition. And I just looked at the schedule and I see that they have a game scheduled for tomorrow evening. And I was afraid my phone would ring and I might have to referee it, but so far it hasn't rang. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, got lady, phone, I got a phone call from Tom Fahey myself last week for a uh, referee, <laughs> but uh, I'm out of action. I'm a, I'm retired on all fronts this year. <laughs> uh, Tommy won't let you. Uh, Tommy, by the way, had to had to referee himself uh, last week because the referee failed to show. And uh, like Tommy has been refereeing, he was refereeing when I moved out here permanently in the seventies. So Tommy returned to the whistle last Sunday because, or last Saturday because the referee failed to show up, okay. and uh, did a, a very competent job as usual. You know, so fair play to him. And yeah, another so man that has definitely a lot of mileage on the clock, but still going very well. <laughs> yes, the ladies, the ladies, the ladies' football has has uh, been quite competitive over the years. Uh, Cavan would have tended to dominate, but then in recent years, Kerry Donegal have come on the scene, and uh, you know, been quite competitive. So it's uh, ladies' football is moving. Very well. so, yeah, I know there, there are also some some uh, uh, clubs that are uh, catering to the underage, uh, and particularly St. Bridget's, and they they have produced a lot of players that uh, are eventually moving up uh, to senior ranks. So, what what grades do we have in the ladies' football? Frank? I I don't know what they have decided this year because some teams decided they weren't going to play, so they they were going to have a modified competition and. The girls on teams that weren't feeling they were going to have, have kind of a draft or a pooling system so that everybody that wanted to play football could play football. Okay. And it's not going to be regarded as a typical New York championship. It will be a championship, I guess, for the best way I could put it, with an asterisk next to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do know, Frank, because my, uh, my wife is a fitness trainer here and she has been, she's been training the Manhattan Gales out in Randall's Island. And they were getting close to 30 people at, at, at training sessions. And she does a bit with O'Donovan Rossa too. And they've been getting their numbers in the 20s. Huge, quite, yeah, huge quite numbers. Well. Huge. And, yeah. and as she said, a lot, of these, a lot of these ladies have never played the game before. They're just coming, they're coming out because it, just to meet people. So it's, 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 a, you know, it's, a, it, it's the GA in action. Like, you know, people just come out. But it's, it's great to get people involved. More than a game. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you're, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, the whole social angle in, in New York, you know, like and kind of like Gaelic Park. Gaelic Park was never just a venue. You know, it was much more than that over, over the years, as you well know. You know yeah. So. At, and, and that's a perfect segue now into the... Uh, so, so we can't make a call on the ladies because we don't know what's going on yet, but it's going, to be, it's going to be good. But you were just saying there, just, just to touch on Gaelic Park, it's something we've touched on um, on previous podcasts here, Frank. So you were telling me that the, they were supposed to break ground on the, the new clubhouse before COVID hit. And obviously yes. it's, it's po- it, everything has stalled now. So have you any updates that you can share with us or what's the... What's the no, no, there's no, there is no further developments. The, uh, we're just about to break ground uh, the, the week when the shutdown or the embargo came on New York. So everything, everything is put on hold. Uh, the, the fundraisers, uh, they're also on hold. And uh, they were promised substantial money from Croke Park and the Irish government. And, uh, you know, due to the... Uh, the revenue of the GA in Ireland taking a serious hit. I'm just, I hope that does not have an impact on New York. The other thing is the biggest supporters and boosters of the GA in New York are basically the, the Irish business people, which are the bar and restaurant owners and the construction companies. And when you look at the teams that run out on Gaelic Park, I would say nine times out of 10, there's a bar or a restaurant or a construction company that's sponsoring them. Now, the New York GA would be depending substantially on those people uh, to contribute to this new development. And as you know, uh, that particular group has taken a serious hit uh, as a result of the virus in New York. So I would not be surprised if the project, well, it, it could be pushed back, uh, you know, another couple of months. Yeah, so Yeah, yeah it's yeah, disappointing because, of course, it's been talked about and planned for maybe 10 years, I, I think, from, from, from speaking to people. So well, it, it was, basically, everything was ready to go until the, until the virus because they, 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 they had a photo op uh, with the various contractors and everything there, and uh, work was supposed to start the next week. And they had lined up, uh, be, besides the, the contractors, uh, they were hoping also to get a lot of voluntary work from you know, the, uh, the uh, construction, the Irish people involved in construction, but yeah. those, a lot of those people out of work or not getting much work, yeah. you know, that also may put a damper on it. So, yeah, so, so funding is probably going to be a big, big issue with a Frank going forward, isn't it? Yes, yes. But then, then again, you know, maybe, maybe within the next six or 12 months, you know, things will rebound. You know, if there's a vaccine uh, found, yeah. I, I think the economy will return fairly quickly. So. Okay. And so just on the, on the, because Frank, you've been up there for many years and I love listening to the old stories about Gaelic Park and, uh, camaraderie up there it used to be a great great hub of Irish activity up there you must have some great great stories yeah. and great memories up there. well I don't know about the, the stories that I, I don't know if I can tell them on this <laughs> platform but as I said Gaelic Park was much more uh, than a venue for games and when I came here first in 1970 uh, a lot of people uh, would, would head into visitation church head into Gaelic Park and they would spend the rest of the day at Gaelic Park because you had the games you had games, you had a restaurant there, and uh, later on you had a band, and people would dine and dance until the early hours of the next morning. And I would say there are many as a man or a woman who found a husband or a, a wife there, and it would be an odd fellow that got a slap that he deserved as well. <laughs> so it, 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 it certainly was a, a major focal point in the Irish community and a, a social center, and uh, people got jobs got apartments. I know myself, uh, I was confronted by a couple of fellas from Donegal a number of years ago. Uh, they found out that somehow or other I had a couple of extra spare rooms. And this fella from Donegal, he was a teacher out here for the summer. He said to me, there are 13 of us in a one bedroom department. Could you put a few of us up? So I said, no problem whatsoever. He said, my, my friend and myself will come and stay with you. I said, I'll pick you up tomorrow evening. So when I picked them up and I, a very famous bar at the Archway. He says, we have two more. I said, who are the other two? He says, two girlfriends. Well, they thought they had girlfriends. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that was straightened out very quickly. <laughs> but anyway, no, yes, Gaelic, Gaelic, Gaelic Park played a major role in Irish and Irish-American life and, you know, in terms of accommodation, jobs, and socialization over the years. Yeah, and you've seen some. Uh, I, you, you must have seen some outstanding players down through the down through the years playing Gaelic Park and some. Uh, you, 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 yes, I did, and you like the first one that I saw, Larry Tompkins, and I always maintain that Gaelic Park helped Larry Tompkins's career. 
because Gaelic Park was considerably smaller at the time. It has been lengthened and widened since. So Larry got used to playing in heavy traffic and probably an odd robust tackle here and there. So I, I think Larry Tompkins' game improved as a result of playing in New York. Then, of course, the players that we brought out, and that includes myself over the years, and uh, I brought out Kieran McDonald from Mayo, and what, what a treat he was uh, to watch. And another man who I think is the only all-star that Wicklow ever had, Kevin O'Brien. Kevin came out and uh, played with us here in the 90s. And what a wonderful talent he was. Uh, some, some, some wonderful hurlers and footballers over the years. Uh, it nearly went to too extreme at one stage. I think I remember a final in the early 80s, and I think there were 13 people uh, that had played in the All-Ireland the previous week or two weeks earlier. Yeah. And that was awfully and, and Kerry players at the time. And of course, some of those players stayed out here and uh, you know, did very well. And speaking of an awfully player that I bump into on the golf course once in a while, and he's a pretty crafty golf, Martin Furlong and, and Jerry and Jerry Carroll, they were off that awfully 82 uh, team. Um, the we- weekend sanctions, of course, used to be a big thing back then, and uh, of course, it's it's shored up now. But we we just said that you would have seen a lot of great players coming for the weekends, and of course, like I suppose the decision was made to focus maybe on more of the people here. Um, what was your take on the weekend sanctions down through the years? Yeah, well, there were kind of mixed views on on the on the weekend sanctions, uh, depending on the number that were allowed. And in recent years, you did not have the high-profile players coming because of the changes in Ireland. In other words, if a team was still in, in, the, in the championship or whatever, or if you were a certain uh, number on, on the, the roster, you couldn't come. So you did not have the real high-profile players that you had years ago. And uh, obviously, many spectators enjoyed seeing these high-quality players. But these players also, uh, and this is a, a very thorny issue, it cost clubs considerable money. Mm. And uh, the, the fact that uh, then when a player will be staying out alone, the, you had to uh, pro- provide accommodation and work for the player. So I, I think that in many instances hurt, uh, you know, the, the cash flow of the clubs here. So the fact that they don't have to deal with that this year, I think that's a, a very uh, positive thing. Yeah. And Frank, just um, on, we were just talking earlier about the uh, the Irish or the American-born players that they're getting into the senior senior ranks now. There's there's been a lot of work done in the underage and the development squads and the development teams down through the last couple of years here in New York, and it's kind of uh, bearing fruit now, isn't it? When you see yeah, like well, I I I, all, I always maintain over the, over the years that the the method that was an operation in New York here would kind of rem- remind you of the oil exporting countries, you know, that there was an over-dependency on players coming out from Ireland here and that we should have kind of uh, do some of our own exploration here in terms of developing uh, the younger players. And New York definitely has taken the right approach. We have two development officers here uh, that are, their specific role is to, uh, develop these young players and you know eventually blend them into senior players and they're doing that very well yeah I've seen some of them last year at some when I was refereeing a few games yeah. when I was involved in New York the Matters brothers as well yeah you know there is some fine and, and players hope, there yes absolutely very very skillful and also are beginning to you know to, to acquire the game knowledge or the, the you know the strategy you know which as I said years ago it was basically just a catch and kick and the Irish American tended to have very good hands but the distribution was often not that great. I'm not saying the Irish distribution is perfect by any means. <laughs> that was the tendency, you know, you got the ball and you let it go as far as you could. Yeah. So, thankfully, that whole mindset has changed. Perfect. Just to end, Frank, there's, um, just so people know that there's, next week in Gaelic Park, there's a 9-11 remembrance ceremony up in Gaelic Park on Friday the 11th of September for people, if they want to come participate in that at 7.30 uh, up in Gaelic Park, just to remember those who uh, lost their yeah. lives in uh, 9-11. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how official it is yet, but there's also another event that will be coming up, which is the 100th anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Croke Park in, in November, whatever it was, uh, 21st, 1920. I think the New York GA board is going to do something to commemorate that here, which would be nice. Too. Okay. Fantastic, fantastic. And so, Frank, thanks very much for giving us that oh, overview and preview. And uh, hopefully we'll get you on in a couple of weeks' time, maybe when we're kind of halfway through the, the championship, just to give us a, an update and to see how our, all our bets are going. 
<laughs> I did not put any money down. <laughs> Thanks, All right, Mike. Mike. Why is Boy, be Randy. And that's all for this week's podcast. Don't forget to check out some of our previous GA podcasts with Cork football legend Larry Tompkins, Dublin footballer Jack McCaffrey, former Galway hurler Johnny Glynn, and former Kerry County board chairman Pat the Bag O'Sullivan on his thoughts on the New York GA scene. Keep up to date with the latest New York Championship match reports by buying a copy of the Irish Voice or Irish Echo, or else log on to irishcentral.com. And don't forget to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. At the Long Haul Podcast. Santi, my dear Annie. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka? And when we got to Bleecker Street, we stopped at 44. Our mother and her sisters there to meet her at the door to me away. You Santi, my dear Annie. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the